Some say history is a river that flows endlessly. I say that history is a series of stories written by each person's experiences. Welcome to Stories, a history of Appalachia, one story at a time. Texas is farther away from Appalachia than Canada, but the Lone Star State shares a culture and an accent with our part of the country. And that's because the folks who founded and led Texas were from the Appalachian parts of Tennessee and Virginia, and they led settlers from those states to Texas early in the 19th century. Today, Rod, we're going to tell the story of one of these men, Stephen F. Austin. That's right, Stephen F. Austin, who... A lot of people did not know came from Virginia because last year, if you remember, the NCAA basketball tournament, Stephen F. Austin University in Nacogdoches, Texas, they made the uh, field of 64, and Mm -hmm. before it was all over with, you know, people were really bragging and saying, oh, Stephen F. Austin came from Texas. Wrong. He came from with County. He came from Virginia, and we're going to tell you more about that. That's right. Stephen Fuller Austin was born November 3rd, 1793, to Moses and Mary Austin in, as Rod said, Wythe County, near the present Austinville, site of lead mines that supplied shot to men fighting in the Revolution and in the Civil War. And those lead mines are what brought the Austin family to Austinville from Connecticut in 1789. Moses and his brother established smelters, furnaces, commissaries, blacksmith shops, and more in the tiny community. And Moses was soon known as the Lead King, and they might have stayed in southwest Virginia if they'd have been more effective businessmen. Their business was too successful, in fact, growing too fast and too burdened with debt. And to get away from that debt, the Austin family moved west in 1798 to Missouri, where they hoped to found a new lead mine. Moses, his wife and children, including young Stephen, led a group of 40 pioneers west of that lead mine, 40 miles west of the Mississippi River in Spanish territory near present-day Potosi, which he'd bought. When young Austin was 11 years old, his parents sent him east for an education, first at Bacon Academy Prep School in Colchester, Connecticut, then on to Transylvania University in Lexington, Kentucky. He graduated from Transylvania in 1810, then began studying the law, intending to set up a practice in Missouri. At 21, he was elected to the Missouri Territorial Legislature. Things were going well for young Austin until 1819. Well, in that year, a financial panic and depression happened, leaving Stephen Austin penniless. So he picked up what he had, moved south to the Arkansas Territory to start over, buying land on the south bank of the Arkansas River in what would soon become the new territorial capital of Little Rock, standing to make some good money on the sale of that land. Austin ran for the territorial legislature, but finished second among six candidates. He was later appointed a judge for the territorial circuit court. Then luck turned against him once again. It seems a reorganization of the government meant that his judicial seat was abolished, leaving him jobless. And that land? Well, Austin's land claim was contested, and the court ruled against him, so no money from the sale of that property. And at that, in November 1820, he moved farther south to Louisiana to study law and practice there. Meantime, the elder Austin, Moses, had been busy himself. He traveled to Mexico City to meet with Spanish officials, where he got a grant from the Mexican colonial government to set up a colony and to bring 300 families to Texas. Shortly after returning to Missouri, Moses Austin caught pneumonia and died, leaving the grant to his son Stephen. Well, it all could have ended right there, but for a letter from Stephen Austin's mother, she convinced him in that letter to pick up his father's mantle and set about fulfilling his dream of a Texas colony. This he did. Austin advertised the Texas opportunity in New Orleans, announcing that land was available along the Brazos and Colorado rivers. A family of a husband, wife, and two children would receive 1,280 acres at 12.5 cents per acre. Farmers could get 177 acres and ranchers 4,428 acres. In December of 1821, the first U.S. colonists crossed into the granted territory on the Brazos River in present-day Brazoria County. It was at this time that Mexico declared its independence from Spain, throwing the whole project into an uproar. The terms of the colony were changed, depending on which Mexican emperor or dictator was in power, but still, Stephen Austin pushed forward. 
Austin brought the first 300 families into the colony by the end of 1825, eventually growing the new colony to over 11,000 in 1832, many coming from the Appalachian parts of Tennessee, Kentucky, and Virginia to settle this rich new Mexican land. But that very success terrified the Mexican government. Fearing a wave of immigrants, legal and illegal, the government began trying to slow it down by introducing a ban on immigration from America and tariff laws. But the settlers kept on coming. Doesn't that sound familiar today? Yeah, from the other direction, yeah. Yeah, it does. <laughs> well, anyway, as we move on, in July of 1833, Austin went to Mexico City to try to get some concessions on these new laws from the Mexican government and to lift the immigration ban but to only limited success. When Stephen Austin returned to his colony, he found things had only gotten worse. How much worse, you ask? Well, bad enough for open rebellion by the colony against Mexico. That's how much worse. The first such rebellion was the Fredonian Rebellion, led by Hayden Edwards, often recognized as the beginning of the Texas Revolution. And in this first revolt, Austin sided with the Mexican authorities, raising troops to fight with Mexican forces against the Texas rebels. Eventually, Austin was arrested by Mexican authorities in Saltillo, Mexico. and They believed that Austin was pushing for Texas independence and trying to incite insurrection. He was taken to Mexico City and imprisoned, but no charges were ever filed against him. He was eventually released in December 1834, and required to stay in Mexico City. A general amnesty in July 1835 finally freed him, and he returned to Texas. Appalachians, including Davy Crockett, flocked to Texas to aid in the rebellion. Many, including Crockett, lost their lives at the Alamo. Tennessee and Sam Houston also came to Texas to fight and became a famous Texan in his own right. Stephen Austin took over command of Texian forces upon his release in 1835, and under his command, colonists won a decisive victory near San Antonio during the Siege of Bexar. By the spring of 1836, the war was essentially over, and Texas was an independent nation. In August of that year, Stephen Austin announced his candidacy for presidency of Texas. But unfortunately for him, so did the extremely popular Sam Houston. After a very vigorous campaign, Austin was soundly defeated by Houston for the presidency. In an act of healing, though, Houston wisely chose Austin as the new nation's first Secretary of State. And Austin set out to serve his new country to the best of his abilities. But, once again, fate stepped in. In December of 1836, Stephen Austin caught a cold. That cold worsened to the point that he died from it on December 27th of that year. His last words were, the independence of Texas is recognized. Upon hearing of Austin's death, Houston ordered an official statement proclaiming, the father of Texas is no more. The first pioneer of the wilderness has departed. Austin was originally buried at Gulf Prairie Cemetery in Brazoria County, Texas. In 1910, Austin's body was reinterred at the Texas State Cemetery in Austin. Austin never married, never had any children, There is a monument to Stephen F. Austin on the banks of the New River in Austinville, recognizing that he was a native of Wythe County. And the state of Texas donated a flag that had flown over the Texas State House to fly at that monument. And that's not actually too far from the New River Trail. If you're on the trail, you can go down there to see that monument and just see exactly where Austinville happened to be at that time. Yeah, it's and it's it's not really that far. I mean, uh, is it... And I'm trying to think here along the lines, is that very far from where the shot tower is? It's not very far from the shot tower, is it? The shot tower is probably about a mile to two miles from the lead mines. Okay, so it's yeah. it's in that general location right in there, Austinville, right. where the mines are and everything. And I've passed by that, used to go that, that way many of a time when I was heading down to Martinsville at times. And it's a beautiful drive down that way, too. You pass right by the uh, the shot tower all the time going on that road. It's beautiful. H- have you been in the shot tower by No, chance? I have not. I you, need to go there. You do need to go there. It, it, it is awesome. Now, I've ridden my bicycle along the New River Trail and have gone up through there. It's interesting. As you get to Austinville, they have large fences where the lead mines used to be. Mm-hmm. To this day, you're not allowed to go over into that area. And it doesn't look any different than anything else. It looks like a field. Mm -hmm. But apparently it's so poisoned by the lead 
that even today you cannot get over there without uh, wow. getting some contamination. Wow. And that's the story of Stephen F. Austin, father of Texas and Southwest Virginia native. Another story that makes up the history of this place we call home. You can follow us on Facebook at Stories of Appalachia and on Twitter at Story Appalachia. We're on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, as well as your favorite podcast app. Be sure to subscribe. Thanks for listening. Till next time, take care. So long, everybody.